Hello. Most of you know that I am Sister Kathleen Drilling, school sister of Notre Dame, and I am the Director of Religious Education here at St. Paul Catholic Newman Center. But that comes after a long uh, life story, which culminates this year with my 50th Jubilee. It's nothing like I expected it would be. So I'd like to give you a little background of what that means to me. I, along with 14 classmates, began a year-long celebration of Jubilee Year. We were professed in 1970 on January 1st. So this year, 2020, January 1st, was the anniversary date of our profession, which started the year-long celebration of Jubilee. Now in the past, that means retreats, special retreats, special, uh, what shall I say, celebrations in your parish, with your family, and then with the entire community. That always happened around August 5th or 6th. Well, breezing along, starting it quietly here at St. Paul Newman with Mass on the 1st of January, I thought I'm in for my 2020 Jubilee year. The Jubilee year is 50 years from biblical sense, and it dates back to, in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 24, recounts a time when the Israelites um, right after the High Holy Days and the Day of Atonement, they would come together to celebrate a year-long um, jubilee, what God had done for them. And they had prescribed rules, just like they had prescribed rules for eating and, and different things, everything, multiple rules. And so one of the things that would happen would be, and it was all, all based on the multiple uh, cycles of seven and because that seems to be pretty prominent in in the biblical uh, times seven days seven days of uh, creation and then God rested on the seventh day six days of working and then resting and so Jubilee is associated with a series of seven days weeks and it comes up to the 49th year and into the 50th year is a sabbatical year. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you just a little bit of what that sabbatical year would encompass for the, for the Jewish folks. Personal liberty. Anyone who was uh, owned by anyone else, a slave or uh, a tenant or uh, somebody that was enlisted in servitude was liberated and set free. There was also restitution of property because the land was so important to the Israelites and became such a, uh, uh, it, 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 their identity was to the land that if someone had to sell their land in that 50th year, all the land would revert back to the original owners. And when they would do that, then it was because God was telling them, the land is mine. You're, you are the tenants on this, on this earth. So the restitution of all property. You also had to let the ground go fallow. Now this was not just a one year, because the 49th year was one of the seven years, and they had practiced this for uh, every seven years to let the, the ground rest just as God had rested on the seventh day of creation and let the ground rest. So you were not to plant crops, to harvest crops, you were to survive on what the earth was presenting to you, to remind you that God would care for you, that you didn't accumulate things, that it all went back. And then as well as that, what happened was it was to have a year of sabbatical a year of rest for yourself, a year of prayer. So to look at that as a jubilee year, for me, 
was quite exciting because I wished to rest. I wished to look at, at what God had in store for me in the future. I'm going to look here just a bit to go back to the beginnings of this and talk about a little more about me. 2020, when it, it appeared in my life that 2020 would be the date of our jubilee, we all looked at it and said, that's easy to remember. 2020 is perfect sight. By 50 years, we should all be able to see perfectly what lies ahead, what we've done, look at it and celebrate. And so we look forward to that. But when we came to religious life 50 years prior, vowed life as a school sister of Notre Dame was just about ready to change. 43 of us started in August for the formation time, which I liken it to a boot camp. What you do is you go in and you have certain stages, postulancy, novitiate, and then uh, temporary profession, and then final vows. And the, your 50th year, the beginning of that, starts with your final vows, or with your first vows, excuse me. 42 of us entered, 40, 43 of us entered, 42 of us were Midwestern from Missouri and Illinois, recently graduated from high school. And then there was one other person, and that was Kathy Drilling. I was 20 years old, and I had moved from college. I was a sorority girl from Fresno, California. And from my point of view, I thought, why am I doing this? Except I couldn't not do this. And as I arrived, I realized that I raised a lot of questions in the mind of the religious community. What are we going to do with her? She's 21. She's lived out in a, in a secular university. What kind of religious background does she really have? What education does she have in prayer and scripture, church doctrine? In general tone, what's been her social interaction in college? And we don't know what this means to be a sorority girl. For me, it was, what am I going to do with all these 17 year olds and pretty much in lockdown because once you entered, you lived in this little pod of cloister for at least two years. I was eager though to begin. And if you look back in 1967, President Kennedy had been assassinated in 1963. Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were yet to be assassinated, but we had everything going on with the social turmoil of the time, with the Vietnam War, my own classmates from high school and college, many of them went off to war, and many of them didn't return. Religious life was changing. Vatican II had ended in 1965, December 8, 1965. But we didn't really know the import of what Vatican II was going to do to change the church, change religious life. That would unfold in my first years of religious life. As I look back, I entered in long black habit, black and white habit, from head to toe. The only things visible to the outside world were my face and my hands. That was left on until you went to bed at night. There was a strict cult, uh, culture of cloistered, being cloistered. The only time we were out in, quote, the world was when we went to teach. With me, I had already gotten to the point where I had really actually um, completed all my classes at Fresno State to be a teacher. But I had nothing of theology, of scripture, 
of catechesis, except for what I had growing up in a Catholic school in grade school, knowing the sisters and attending St. Aloysius Church in Tulare. So most of my formation for the first and second year were in study of religious uh, topics, scripture, spirituality, and religious life. And so I was prime property, if they needed a teacher anywhere, to leave the rest of my class to be sent out to teach. And of course, I was going to teach uh, reading and writing at grade school. That indeed happened to me. I, I left after two and a half years and went out to teach where the rest of my class stayed in to finish off their college education. We also changed from the habit. We went from, we even actually had uh, fashion shows on what kind of a habit would we wear. All of a sudden, uh, we had to do something with our hair. We had to buy new sho shoes. We had to take all the habits that we had, take them, rip them out, and use the material to create suits, jumpers, uh, the, at least, I don't know, half of you might not know what a jumper was, but anyway, our new habits were called modified habits. And we, had a, we went from uh, a veil that covered our entire head, except for our face, to these little pillbox type things that were on the top of our head and then came down to our shoulders. All of this happened within a, a short amount of time after it, Entry. I had another name which was given to me. I did not choose it. But within six months, they said you can go back, either keep that name or go back to your baptismal name. I chose to go back to my baptismal name because they gave me a man's name and I didn't want to have a man's name. Um, so you can see that life changed drastically for us. And now we were out in the world, but not in the world. We didn't go anywhere except with another sister. We didn't go anywhere uh, without permission. One thing that was gratefully received was we actually um, were able to go home. When I first entered and got on the plane, I could only go home once in my lifetime. And that we had to choose which parent's funeral would we attend. We did that because of our greater desire to follow God, to follow the, the call, so to speak. Within about two years or to five years, they changed that so that we would go home every seven years and we would be allowed a two week vacation with our family. Being from California and living in Missouri for the early part, uh, the families could come and visit uh, once a month on Sunday out on the front lawn or in a, the auditorium if it was cold. But for me, I couldn't because my parents were home. And so um, I don't know if the sisters really realized this, but I found out that they actually had a telephone with an outside line in the bakery. And so after we all were in bed, I would sneak down to the, to the bakery, sit in the corner of the room, and uh, call my parents on a line. And because we were ahead of them and it was still early back there, I would make a point to call at Christmas and Easter and on the visiting Sundays. And I thought I wasn't exactly breaking the rule because everybody was allowed to visit their parents on that day. But it never occurred to the sisters that maybe some of us from California would like to make a phone call. So you can see there was quite a, a distance between this 2020 January 1st and the 20 and the uh, January 1st of 50 years ago. So what happened with this one? The excitement came and I remember we entered the month of March and the month of March all of a sudden we were contemplating what to do if the possibility of shutdown came. In my personal life, 
we had just moved my mother into from a larger facility into a very small residential facility where we felt that she would get some more personal care. That was on March 6th. On March 16th, we shut down completely and so did the uh, residential care for my mother. And so we were unable to visit with her until around March uh, 20th, the lady, uh, the head of the, the facility called and said, there's something wrong. And they took her to the hospital because she was having a difficulty breathing. With that, the COVID virus or coronavirus uh, had sh totally shut down hospitals and we could choose only one person. And so my sister Patty, who is a dentist and knows a lot of things about medical things and was living right there uh, 10 minutes away, I said, you go ahead, you go see mom, you visit mom. Not really knowing what was you know coming. She did that and we, they made a decision to move her back to the residential home and put her on hospice. And they allowed us to visit with her for one day. On March 29th, I was coming back on that day, or the, on the 30th, but we received a call on March 29th that my mother had quietly passed away. But we did get to visit with her uh, on the 28th as an entire family. So that's how I started quarantine. That's how I started all of this. Not just the personal loss for me, but the loss of uh, how were we going to confirm about 80 kids? How were we going to have First Communion? How were we going to get up and um, actually minister again? And then it dawned on me when the letter came, it really was a phone call, there will be no Jubilee celebration this year. And we are all praying and we will figure out when we can celebrate at another time. And so that was taken away too. And I really had to go inside myself. I was locked down and I had to say, how do I deal with this? How do I celebrate Jubilee, the year of Sabbath? And I went basically back to Leviticus, basically back to what could I do? And I used that time as best I could. I read a, an article just yesterday that Pope Francis was talking about. He's had three COVID times in his life. And he recounted these three COVID times, likening it them to now, but times when he was taken away and transferred. He was, he was on a sabbatical time, a time that would cause him to go deeper and prepare him. And he, he gives this one account where he actually read through all 37 volumes of the history of every Pope from Peter to himself. And he's, or excuse me, it wouldn't be to himself, but whoever was Pope at the time this, he was doing this, 37 volumes. And he said, I don't know why I ever chose that. I could have had good novels and things like that, but I chose that. And he said, today it is invaluable to me to know the history of the papacy and what, what God has been working in his church for all of this time. And so I started on my own journey. One of the things that was offered to me, which the community set up, anybody who could sign up for free, would go through what they called um, sabbatical summer. Every Monday in would come from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, or Milwaukee, I believe. It would come a lecture, and it was all on racism. And it was six weeks with the seventh week would be our time to present what we're going to do. It started me on a path of, I thought 
I knew what racism was. And I thought I certainly wasn't racist. But the more I knew, the more I understood, the more I heard America's story of what we have done in the name of racism. I began to realize that racism, and I, I know right now some will not agree, but racism is systemic in our country. Racism is, racism is not out here. It is the water we swim in. And you cannot help. And on further prayer and examination of my own life, I have to say that at times I have been racist. I am racist. But it's what I do with that because I've been breathing in that water, drinking that water for my whole life. And I want to tell you one little story. At one point, I was supposed to go to a, a convention to understand why people of color did not enter our religious community. And I was realizing that I was going to a mother house for an all African American religious community of women. And I'd be there for four days and for the first time in my life, I would knowingly walk into a situation where I was the minority, where everything and everyone outside was different. And I, the thought flew between my ears and into my brain and said, I hope the place is clean. I came to the realization by just having that thought that there were kernels and certainly I wasn't an out there racist, but I had tendencies that I needed to deal with. And so I did. I'm far from finished, but I started reading books. I started watching uh, videos. I started looking at uh, podcasts. I finished this actual uh, seminar and I continued on. So that took hold in me. I had to deal with grief. And then there was the overwhelming grief of all the people in the United States who have lost their loved ones and suffered through this. And the very beginnings of that for, for me uh, set me to wondering why we haven't been more proactive to grieve together in what for our country. And then on top of all of that, to go through the election, uh, to go through the separation between peoples and, I, and everything. So it, God had a different thing in mind for me for Jubilee, and it's ongoing. And I know that you have all settled into whatever your new normal is right now, but we have a ways to go, and I hope we can go it together along the path. So that's where I am today. I will still celebrate Jubilee. I have celebrated Jubilee. And yesterday I received an envelope with, from a fifth grader I had in 1976, thanking me for what I had done to help him in his faith formation. And so Jubilee is not about how I celebrate. It's about who we all have been. And so I challenge you with a question. In your own lives, what has been your Sabbath time? How have you used it? How have you grown? And how much closer are you to the God who called you by name and loves you beyond any measure you can imagine, even during this time of lockdown, of Sabbath? Maybe it's a shift of the mindset and jubilee.